Like many of you watching, the Forward Promise Village of Grantees, Fellows, and National Advisory Committee members have pivoted in these past few weeks to respond to the rapidly unfolding, multifaceted crises created by the COVID-19 pandemic. Our most vulnerable communities and populations have been hard hit by this crisis, and we wanted to talk to those who directly serve them about how their work is being impacted, how they are responding, their greatest challenges and highest hopes in the midst of all of it. Welcome, my name is Dr. Howard Stevenson and I'm co-director of Forward Promise and we thank you for being here. With us today are Dr. John Rich and Dr. Ted Corbin, co-directors of the Center for Nonviolence and Social Justice at the Drexel University School of Public Health in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. At the center, they work to promote health, nonviolence, and social justice through trauma-informed practice, research, professional development, and advocacy for policy change. Dr. Corbin is a professor in the Department of Emergency Medicine at the Drexel University College of Medicine. Dr. Rich is a professor of the Drexel University School of Public Health. He has been a leader in the field of public health and, in, and his work has focused on serving one of the nation's most ignored and underserved population, African-American men in urban settings. Thank you both for being with us today. Pleasure, pleasure to be here. Thank you, Howard. So we have been talking um, in many ways uh, to many of our grantees and uh, we wanted to get your perspective on how COVID-19 has had an impact on the way you do your work in, in, in the communities that you serve. Yeah, it's been, it's been quite uh, um, jarring and uh, we had to respond quickly. Um, our, one of our cornerstone programs, Healing Hurt People, um, where we work with young, particularly young men of color who've been impacted by violence and trauma. Um, and this is usually a, a face-to-face -face meeting introduction to the program. And so we had to flip to, to telehealth and making those connections virtually, which you can imagine, are, it's quite challenging given the experience that the young person has gone through. And, and what's, what's sad in so many ways is that violence is up during this pandemic. And so the need is is greater and so our efforts to make those connections virtually and relying on colleagues in hospitals to make those referrals has been has been a bit of a challenge but i would say that it's almost an imperative that they reach out to us now given um the compounded trauma and stress that our young people and communities are experiencing with this pandemic, and then you add the layer of, of violence and trauma. And so we just we're just emphasizing and trying to encourage our hospital colleagues to continue the referral or or push them even harder to to make that referral. Mm -hmm. I think we you know we feel very much that these are vulnerable young people in the sense that they face structural racism. They often live in communities where the resources aren't there to support them and then they've suffered a violent injury and mm -hmm. in this moment when we now ask families to uh, stay at home to lose their income and to then uh, lack even what were a relatively meager set of re resources that they had at a time of trauma we have to shift how we're thinking about supporting families because this is a there's 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 an undercurrent of structural violence and trauma that is always there and yeah. this simply shines a brighter light on it but it doesn't it hasn't necessarily moved these structures to think differently about how to support these young people in these moments so our staff now are thinking much more about how do we meet the fundamental food and housing needs, the monetary needs of families, how do we help young people get access to the technology that will allow them to continue to learn and to be able to feel safe? And then how do we reinforce to them 
that there are ways in which we can help them to stay safe, even if we can't be physically present with them. Mm. With some of our uh, other grantees as well, talking about how the structural issues of inequity and racism have affected uh, not only the youth, but also their families and the programming. Do you all have an example of how those, those issues kind of um, have clashed in a way, uh, not only in how you provide the work, but how young people have had to navigate? Yeah. I, I... I think John alluded a little bit to it where, um, where you know, our, one of our key focuses uh, is connecting with a young person, usually a young man of color, a young person of color, um, to provide them with behavioral health support, peer support. Um, but again, that, that, that initial relationship is developed in person. So we have to pivot to do this virtually. And so with that being a challenge, Something else that comes up is that mom's lost a job. They only live with mom. They can't go out. They don't have money for food. It's kind of hard to have a conversation if you're hungry and you're worried about your mom. And so we, in some instances, and then, and then add that, that they don't have access to technology. And so we've had to pivot in some ways, figuring out how we could get food to the family. Um, we had to contact a local store, um, purchase a voucher so that mom could go in and get the food that she needed um, for the while. And then at the same time, this young person, the phone plan and the phone stopped working. And so figuring out how to get them a phone and also mm -hmm. some service. Now, some places have been um, generous. And so this, you know, the Wi-Fi has been or the Internet has been or the the digital plan um, has been discounted. But what we're also learning is that the, the bandwidth in some of the neighborhoods yeah. And so, um, so there's a, another layer of, of structural racism that's happening um, that, that we, we have to pay attention to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wonderful. I mean, that, and then the larger conversation, national conversation about um, the illumination of disparities, it's rarely specific in a way that you just described, um, even with the disparities in how phone plans are, are thought about or access uh, is multi-layered. Um, how has how this also maybe affected how you manage your staff or how you um, take care of your staff and the stress that they're also going through? We've, you know, continued to be very intentional about meeting with our staff on a very regular basis. So we've instituted coming together through a Zoom meeting so that we can all see each other. And we spend a good amount of that time talking about what are the struggles that you're facing? How are you doing self-care? How can we support you in doing self-care? What are our expectations and how do we impact those expectations. Um, we want you to work while you're working at home, but we also want you to be able to navigate the home environment, which may not have a private room for you to be talking with your clients from. Um, you may have to leave the house to get food and those kinds of things. So we've been very clear that we are there to support them in their work, but that we're very concerned about their physical, health, their physical and emotional safety. And we have been very explicit about the security of their employment during this time. And that's been critical. We've been, it, it, the worst thing that we could do would be to have this external circumstance, tragic as it is, disrupt the livelihood of these young people who have really dedicated themselves to this work when they could have been doing lots of other types of work. And so we've, um, we're have working hard to make sure that we can make good on that promise for as long as we need to make good on that promise, um, mm -hmm. doing making whatever adjustments we can within the organization to, to be there. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. And I, I think, um, you know, knowing both of you and how you are often speaking to very different audiences from politicians to young people to educators to uh, physicians and 
and provided fields, are there recommendations you would make to these audiences um, about how to um, be more smart about the future of addressing these issues in your communities and, and with the families and young people you serve? Yeah, I, I think, you know, we were, we listened to um, an interview uh, with um, Bill Gates. And it's interesting that I can't remember how many years ago he, he pretty much talked mm -hmm. about this happening. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I feel it is imperative that we learn lessons from this and prepare right after this or during this so that we're equipped to, to handle any type of, um, any type of challenge like this. I, I think it's especially important um, that we raise up, as you mentioned, the disparities in our communities of color. Because mm -hmm. even though the rise came lately, we know the rise keeps coming and it'll still be with us long after it's past the other communities. And so I, I just, I yeah. just, it just bothers me. <laughs> and pains me that we we end up being the sufferers for a longer period of time after the pandemic is, has been addressed. Mm -hmm. and I couldn't agree more and I there's a continuing issue about how we build the kind of communication and trust within communities at times of great uncertainty because I there's a gentleman who was a, a kind of a hero of mine a, uh, who I met in Boston, a psychiatrist named Chester Pierce. And oh, yeah. Chester Pierce. Of and course. Uh, he, just a giant. But one of, you mm -hmm. know, he worked for NASA and he, a lot of his work was about what is the psychological condition of people who are in space with regard to trusted sources of information? Because when you're up in space, separated completely from your supports, and people tell you everything's going to be okay, or you say, how's my family? They're like, oh, fine. You know they wouldn't tell you if your family weren't fine right. because you're in space, right? And I think that <laughs> the, the analogy between people in environments, urban environments, people of color, who do not trust the sources of information, particularly because the, the reality of this, there's a lot we don't know. Right. And so when the ground shifts, there is a lack of trust and therefore it's hard to know how people can mobilize. And that's where investing in a public health infrastructure that includes community health workers, people in the community on the ground who become credible messengers, not only about issues of violence, but credible mm -hmm. messengers about public health, that the infrastructure isn't only a stockpile of ventilators in these times, Mm -hmm. It is investing in the human capital in communities so that people in those communities have someone to turn to for needed resources and needed information so that they can react in a timely fashion. Um, because many of the people, as you know, are the ones who are meeting the needs of us who are privileged enough not to be a, not to have to go into the office, but rather can work from home. And that is a that yeah. itself is a is a grinding inequity. Yes, and I know that you and others of our grantees have been working in communities where culture is a central factor in remembering those kinds of issues, remembering, um, you know, not only systems, but the people at the, at the lowest levels who keep those systems alive for us to thrive and uh, to forget them and their needs is, um, is not only a cultural um, um, violation but it's also a way to to not take care of the system as a whole to not think that, about the health of the entire network community village however you think about it i sometimes get frustrated with another commission is trying to analyze why these disparities occur and and not about what you've just mentioned regarding how do we create policies that talk about solutions with what we know and what we have known and I think you all and your work is, is key um, uh, helping us do that. But um, anything else you would mention 
uh, as we we close up regarding this issue you think maybe people don't understand or from your work you know i i think um i just hope that folks in our communities our, our black and brown um families uh understand the gravity of of this pandemic and if and when um, they're able to stay home. Um, it is really, it is really what's helping them stay alive. I also hope that they also recognize that all the precautions that have been um, shared are are real in terms of wearing face masks, you know, and using, you know, washing your hands after you've been out, you know, just all of those. All those things that seem simplistic really do save lives. And so washing hands, wearing masks, when you sneeze, sneeze into your arm. It's just, mm -hmm. it's just really important that we, we subscribe to those, those recommendations. And with yeah. those recommendations, also um, being able to hold two things at once, which is there are some activities, some actions we need to take now. And that does not, eliminate our understanding that these are long-standing structural inequities, that every medical health problem is worse in the face of structural inequality. But we can't let that larger reality paralyze us in the moment, because this moment is a moment where we all have to react and act to the best of our ability. We have to help each other. But it can only be a conversation it comes up when there's a, the structural violence can't only be a conversation that comes up when there's a, a, a disease outbreak or a disaster or a Katrina or something like yes. that. This has to be yes. a conversation that is both thought about in terms of resources and funding and a shift in how, in the mindset and the worldview that has often been brought to communities that are really integral to, as you, as you said, how we survive these kinds mm -hmm. of events. Yeah. Well, this has been so helpful and thank you so much for taking the time. Um, our, our job is to try to get this out to as many people who will listen. And um, I, uh, we are praying for you and the work that you are doing. And thank you. Thank you so much. Same to you, Howard. Thank you. Thank you. Take care now. You too. Take care.